Welcome back to another episode of Keep It Fictional with the Port Moody Public Library. I am Virginia. I am here with Corinne and also Fiona. Both of them have a lot of energy today. I can see. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, well, it's a new year. New year. And that means for us book lovers here, that means new books. That's the only thing we care about here. Um, so for the next two episodes, we are going to tell you about some of the books that are coming out this January to April. So in the first four months of the year, what we have got in our like what in the future for our reading life and what we are going to read. What were we most looking forward to reading? Um, so yeah, so we're going to have two episodes. I call this the light episode because this is with Corinne and Fiona, the ones who have like the lighter stuff. And next week, we're going to bring you to the darkness where you got Liz and me who have the darker picks, I feel like. Or maybe, maybe Fiona and Corinne will surprise me. I don't know. We can also call this the cult nun episode. I don't know if that's going to <laughs> a cult of nuns. I don't know. I don't know if those are going to come up. And maybe, of course, probably with a side of murder. I would think that there would be quite a bit of murder today. So we'll find out. Um, so yeah, so uh, let's start with Fiona. Tell us about, you know, one of the books that you're looking forward to reading this season. So my first book is... Uh, homage to Sadie. Uh, it is not necessarily my usual thing. It is a YA retelling of Briar Road, Rose. And uh, there are two things that have drawn me to this book. Um, first of all, the cover. Um, oh my gosh, look at that axe. Uh, if you cannot look at that axe, it is two uh, young uh, female presenting characters looking, I don't know if I'm allowed to say badass on this podcast, but they look badass. Uh, one of them has an axe. I, she's going to be the like um, wood, wood chopper character. Uh, and then the other character, uh, and that's Shane. And the other character's name is Fee, which is what leads me to what of uh, the other thing that drew me to this book um, because I have not read a book, I don't think, where with my name as the character's name. Um, so this is uh, billeted as a, a Sleeping Beauty meets An Indiana Jones. Um, interesting. So I believe uh, Shane and Fee are treasure hunters um, and they uh, get entangled with the kind of like ghost of Prince Briar Rose um, and they need to wake him up. Um, so I'm excited with the kind of gender bending, gender swap there and also promises to be queer representation. Um, this is by Leslie Vetter, uh, promises dark magic, um, oh, uh, run-ins with bad exes, uh, which I find appealing, <laughs> and uh, possibly true love. So very excited for this and of course we'll be thinking of Sadie all the way. Oh that's so nice. We all I feel like we all should read a Sadie book. I keep thinking about that when I was picking the book. I'm like, that's a Sadie book. That's a Sadie book. Oh, but thank you. Thank you for bringing Sadie into the, onto the show, um, representing Sadie. And Fiona, there is a book that I keep that's coming out already, or maybe already come Fiona and Jane that you keep seeing everywhere. I think, yeah, got Fiona, Fiona main I character. I did see that one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll have to, to put that on my TBR that. too. <laughs> it's like Sadie when she say how excited she was when she got, you know, that book that is called Sadie. So yeah. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Corinne, what is your first book? All right. Coming in at number five. Um, unlike Fiona, who chose like a nice tribute to Sadie, I am just selfishly doing myself. This entire list is just me. 
just me. Um, so coming in at number five is a new adult book by one of my favorite humorous Canadian authors. Actually, you know what? This is a tribute to Fiona in that it is an actual Canadian author um, who wrote one of my favorite books of all time, which is the Wolfield Poultry Collection. This one is a murder mystery. It centers around Helen Thorpe, who is smart, always calm, cool, and collected and has an answer for everything. And so what does a person like that, what kind of profession do they go into? I mean, other than librarianship, obviously. No, um, Helen is a butler. Helen Buttles. Um, Buttles being one of my favorite words in the entire English language. And she has sent her entire professional life kind of taking care of the rich and famous and glamorous, some which she appreciates a little bit more than others. Um, she has been called back to a spiritual retreat uh, where she used to work at the Yatra Institute on one of British Columbia's Gulf Islands. I know this is so, so Canadian and so local. It's very out of character for me. And obviously this is very difficult for me to talk about right now, but we're going to go ahead. Um, but the former owner of the uh, Yatra Institute, Edna, who was an, an elderly, lovely lady, has died and has left Helen instructions on how to settle the estate. Um, because out of all the people that she knew, friends, family around her, um, Edna always trusted Helen. And why wouldn't you trust the butler? However, as Helen uh, gets to the island to kind of settle things between the bickering family, her suspicions start to grow. She begins to suspect that perhaps Edna's death was not as natural as it is being paid off. And so she decides to enlist the help of her classmates, other butlers in training to do a full butler investigation of this murder and figure out the mystery of what happened to Edna. Uh, it has got, you know, everyone on an island. Great trope. It's got maybe the butlers probably didn't do it. Probably. Well, I don't know. Um, and it has like rich people bickering over an inheritance, which is like a classic murder mystery. So I am very excited to uh, read Susan Juby's Mindful of Murder. I think her first foray into a mystery novel that I am greatly looking forward to. Thank you, Miss Corinne. Now that I see the author, I'm like, okay, that's why Corinne is reading it. <laughs> but I love the idea of a, a butler, like a butler school. There are butler schools. So as someone who spent a brief amount of time in the service, um, <laughs> I can say that that is accurate, that you usually go to a butling school um, where they teach you how to properly buttle. That's awesome. <laughs> That is awesome. Uh, great. All right. Um, so two different picks, but very interesting, both of them. Um, Fiona, what have you got next for us? Okay. I am very excited about this next one. Uh, Peach Blossom Spring by Melissa Fu. Uh, this is uh, the story of... Um, Mei Lin in uh, 1938 China uh, during the Japanese invasion and uh, her son Ren Shru in their uh, escape uh, from China. Then uh, it picks up with Ren Shru who is now known as Henry Dao uh, as an adult uh, where he has settled in the States. And his daughter, Lily, who desperately wants to know about their family past, um, but Henry is reluctant to tell her. Uh, so this is a format that I love. Three Generations uh, is just such, I think, a wonderful way to write a book, explore a family, uh, explore changes over time. And uh, the author is looking at what it means to be home. Um, I, I uh, as you you may know already, I am a big fan of Lisa C. And I know there's lots of other comparisons, but every time I'm just like, oh yeah, this is gonna scratch that itch. Um, I really really love multi generational uh, books and and talking about family secrets um, and and how. Uh, family grows over time. So really, really looking forward to 
Peach Blossom Spring with a beautiful cover by Melissa Fu. And Fiona really does love a lot of multi-generational stories because she's going to make us do an episode on it soon. So that's how much she loves it. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. Really looking forward to that, <laughs> Fiona. Thank you so much for putting that in front of us. <laughs> uh, all right, Corrine, what have you got? Well, I can tell you that it is not a multi-generational family saga. However, it does involve like the legacy of family and like generational trauma, but also violence. Um, so coming in at number four for me is a new author. Uh, that has been a book that has been generating a lot of buzz that kind of combines a love of mysteries um, and family mysteries. I love a good family mystery and also uh, classical music, which I do enjoy, specifically Tchaikovsky. So I'm very excited about this. And it is written by a bit of an insider. So it should be a very juicy take on the classical music world. Um, so this is about Ray McMillan. And um, Ray has essentially ever since he heard the violin, always known that that is what he wants to do more than anything else in the world. He wants to be a classical musician. However, all of the odds are stacked against him. Um, Ray is black. He is growing up in rural North Carolina. Um, his own family doesn't really support his dream. They think he should get a real job. Um, it, he finds it hard to go to competitions because he can't really afford a, a high caliber violin. He can't find the right teachers. And there is the racism inherent in the classical musical world that he is constantly fighting against. But despite all of those odds, he is succeeding. And kind of the ace up his sleeve is that he discovers that a, a kind of a family heirloom, his great grandfather's fiddle that has kind of been passed around and sitting and gathering dust in the corner for, for years and years is actually a Stradivarius, you know. A Strad, the most famous, most expensive, most sought after violin in the entire world. And so he brings this to one of the most important competitions of his life at the Tchaikovsky competition, as they say, the Olympics of classical music, which is a delightful turn of phrase. Um, However, the eve before he is about to compete with this family heirloom, with this Stradivarius, it suddenly goes missing. And what is worse is that even as it is going missing and Ray is trying to track this down, there are people arguing about who actually owns this instrument. Um, Ray's family thinks that it should belong to them. However, the descendants of the man who once enslaved Ray's great-grandfather are also claiming that they own the Stradivarius. Um, it is a story about about everything that you kind of want. It's got a little bit of mystery, a little bit of family history. I love that uh, Brendan Slocum, the author, is kind of like tackling uh, racism and kind of that intergenerational trauma in the classical music world. I think it's going to be a big hit. Um, it is The Violin Conspiracy by uh, Brendan Slocum. And I think it's got a great cover. And I think it's going to be a little bit of a wild ride. It's one of those books um, that you come across in the blurb every once in a while that really has something for everyone. And so I am very, very excited to pick this one up. Thank you, Miss Corrine. All right. Uh, there's two books, two books that pretty much books that I expect both of you to pick, I think. Yeah, it's good. Well, it's good. Like you said, like, you know, I think we deserve a year to be selfish and read the stuff that we want to read rather than what we are supposed to read or whatever. Except for a family saga and a book set in an office. <laughs> <laughs> Upcoming episodes of Keep It Fictional that we are all looking forward to reading. Um, so yeah, so Fiona, tell us about another book that you're looking forward to reading. 
Absolutely. I'm also just going to warn you that I heard um, Corrine throw out the number five and I had the number four in my head. So I have four books, just FYI. <laughs> but I'm very excited to tell you about the third of four books. And so the way I did push myself a little bit uh, in choosing these books that I'm excited about is like, I usually, as you know, I usually talk about like safe things where I'm like, I like that author. I'm excited about their next thing. Um, I have chosen some debuts uh, for this one. So, you know, maybe that's just what happened or maybe I'm just exploring new horizons. Who knows? So I believe my next pick is a de debut. It is uh, Four Treasures of the Sky uh, by uh, Jenny Tinghua Zhang. Um, and it is kind of like the flip side of um, the coin for Spe Peach Blossom Spring uh, in that it is, uh, it takes place over uh, a longer period of time uh, following the life of Dayu, um, her time in China uh, to when she is kidnapped and smuggled across the ocean to America. And it is set against uh, the 1980s um, Chinese Exclusion Act. Um, so that is part of what drew me to it. It's something that is a historical um, uh, event that I'm really trying to understand more about. Um, so yeah, that really drew me into it, but it's also this uh, idea of instead of being a family saga, it's like a personal saga. Um, so Dayu has to constantly reinvent herself. Um, she works as a calligraphy, or she goes to a calligraphy school. Um, she works in a brothel. She works at a cafe and is constantly uh, reinventing herself um, because she doesn't have that, that family um, to define her. Uh, and so it's like just this, I love this idea that, you know, like, um, everything is about family and your story, um, comes from that and builds on that with all of these people. And then the other option is that, uh, it's, it's you in the world, defining yourself, finding found family. Um, and it's like, like two tropes, like on the opposite end of the spectrum. And I love them both. Um, so, I'm gonna show you the cover again because it's just gorgeous. We've got a koi fish um, and there's like sort of like a watery face uh, if you can't see it. Uh, this is Four Treasures of the Sky um, and it is a historical fiction um, that I can't wait to get my hands on. Also promises to uh, be set uh, in parallel with Chinese folklore, which, you know, is always a good choice. Thank you, Fiona. I love debut novels because you just never know, right? It's always, it's, it's perfect for a new year when you're trying to meet new authors. I love it. All right, Corinne, what have you got? All right, coming in at number three is the story of Hornclaw. Hornclaw is 65 years old. She's not moving as fast as she used to. She's, she's feeling kind of like her mental edge at work slipping a little bit. Um, she gets, she gets an, in, an injury, which means she has to go to the doctor. And so she's not, not as, as lithe and as useful, uh, as useful as he used to be. And she feels like it might, might be time to kind of hang up the old hatchet and, and maybe retire for a little bit, just kind of enjoy the retire, um, the time to herself and her, her modest small apartment with her aging rescue dog named Deadweight, just kind of live out the rest of her days and in, in quiet, gentle solitude. And just enjoy those twilight years. But that is not to be, that is not to be. Hornclaw has always kind of prided herself in being a professional. Um, she has always been dispassionate about her book, uh, about her work, not really being involved in like office politics. Um, she gets her assignments. Uh, she does the work. And at the end of the day, she doesn't think too much about it. She just kind of closes the book on it and, and goes about her life. She doesn't like to get involved with, with people or workplace or anything like that. Um, 
and you know that has served Hornclaw very well because Hornclaw is not a bookkeeper or an accountant or you know anything else Hornclaw is a straight up assassin Hornclaw kills people Hornclaw is very good at killing people uh whether it is a corporate enemy a cheating spouse a double crosser if you give the job to Hornclaw Hornclaw will take care of it but you know in her elderly years she's 65 years old she's slowing down a little bit she decides that maybe maybe it's time to to just kind of try to live a normal life for a little while but unfortunately um her career as what she calls a disease control specialist is not to be because a younger stronger agent has made it clear that he's her enemy and she doesn't know why <laughs> she's not sure and honestly she doesn't care until this younger agent starts taking out and hurting the people around her those carefully selected people that despite her better nature she has started to care about and so what begins, sorry, let me take that again. <laughs> uh, what begins as a petty annoyance becomes a deadly showdown in the first translated novel from Gu Byung Mo, The Old Woman with the Knife. Uh, this is the first book translated from Korean by this author who is a sensation, um, and I am super exciting, uh, excited for it. I honestly think this is uh, a me book and a Liz book, so I think we are both really, really pumped to hear the story of an aging assassin who has got just a couple more kills left in her. I think that has the best title yet. Just Woman with the Knife. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. All right. Uh, I guess before we talk about the last three books, apparently, because Fiona has four only, <laughs> um, let's give, you know, maybe a question for the day is, what are you looking forward to this year? What in 2022, are you excited about? Corinne, I can tell she's very excited about something. What else I, would it be? I am excited. I am excited. Obviously, there's a lot of great books coming out, a lot of things that for each of us that are kind of playing into our wheelhouses of books that we love. But the thing that I am most excited about in 2022 is that there is going to be a new album from BTS. And I am super excited. They have said that they are starting a new chapter. I suspect it's all actually going to be inspired by The Midnight Library by Matt Haig, because that's what they were reading in the soup. Um, but I am so excited for, for new music. Um, I, I love a new album and I think it'll be great. So yes, that is, that is helping me get up every morning. So we have to ask this question only because so that she can tell you about BCS. That is the only reason why this question exists. It super is. There's no release date, date yet. And it's like rumor, but it's like kind of confirmed, but not totally confirmed by big hit. But, but anyways, it's coming. All right. <laughs> Fiona, what are you looking forward to? I have purchased a subscription to Prime exclusively to watch the new season of The Marvelous Mrs. Mabel that is coming out in March, I believe. Uh, so this is an amazing show uh, about a Jewish woman in the 1950s in New York. Um, and her husband is kind of like casually doing stand-up comedy. Um, and then not necessarily related to the fact that he is, she finds out he is stealing that comedy. Um, they get a divorce, but that's not the only reason. He's also having an affair. Um, and then she uh, kind of finds herself um, on the stage uh, making people laugh and she uh, becomes a comedian. Uh, holy moly, it is a wonderful staff. Um, Amy Sherman Palladino is the marvelous Mrs. Maisel and she is so charming um, and has the best clothes ever. Uh, maybe like 50% of why I watch it, uh, but the rest is all good as well. And my favorite, oh, 
sorry, pardon me, that it is uh, Rachel Bush, uh, Borsnahana, who is um, Mrs. Maisel, sorry, I've got that wrong. Uh, but the best part is actually her parents, her dad played by Tony Shalhoub, and her mom played by Marin Hinkle. Um, and they are so funny. And, you know, maybe remind me a little bit of parents that I know. Um, and I just like, I can't, I can't wait. Thank you, 2022, <laughs> for bringing me a new season of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Oh, that's great. I have to say, I don't even remember when it's the last time I watched a show. I don't know. I don't know. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, what are you looking oh, forward to, Virginia? Don't ask me that. Um, I have like, I, I, I was thinking of, I'm like, I can't think of anything. I don't even know what I have to look forward to tomorrow. So I'm like, what is this? I, I don't know. So the only thing I could think of, which I'm like going back to books, is I know that I have to finish reading all the Mistborn because the seventh book is coming out in November. That's my, that's the only thing I'm like, okay, well, because new book is coming. I haven't actually touched that series. So that's the only thing I could think of. This is how sad my life is. So Yeah. <laughs> I thought you said this was the light episode, Virginia. I know, but the, I'm here, so I have to bring in that sadness. You know how it is. <laughs> all right, let's get back to happy then. Let's get back to happy. Um, all right, I'm going to go with Corinne so that we can have Corinne, Fiona, Corinne. <laughs> this is amazing. Um, okay, so coming in at number two, uh, Heist Heist, baby. I love a heist movie. I think that's why I enjoy the Fast and Furious franchise so much, even though honestly, they're pretty bad at heists now that I think about it. Like they straight up just took a, like a giant safe on the back of cars through Rio de Janeiro, which lacks elegance. Okay, maybe they are in heist movies. Anyways, um, the Oceans franchise, fine, 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 fine. Um, but I do love a heist book and I am super, super excited about this one, which is kind of giving me some like, uh, leverage vibes, which is one of my favorite TV shows of all time. Um, it is described as a lush lyrical heist novel, mm -hmm. um, inspired by the true story of Chinese art vanishing from Western museums. Uh, uh. Um, so this is a little bit of the of a commentary about the art world, which I also love. I mean, if one thinks about the British Museum, as John Oliver says, the largest active crime scene in the world, um, that, about museums and ownerships and who should own items of art that belong to different countries or different people or different groups, like what gives a museum the right to own, quite frankly, anything because if we think about the history of art and who owns it it's often a story of colonialism and exploitation people with money would march into different countries and essentially take what they want and then put it in their museums so this book is a bit of a commentary on that um, but it's also a fun heist story um, it is a story of Will Chen, um, who is a senior at Harvard. He is a perfect student, an art history major, you know, dabbles in a little bit of art now and then. He's the eldest son who is like the apple of his parents' eye. Um, but, you know, he, he kind of doesn't feel at home either here or there. And so when a shadowy corporation reaches out to him with an impossible and illegal job offer, he decides to try on another role, that of mastermind, leader of a heist to steal back five priceless Chinese sculptures looted from Beijing centuries ago. He's got a crew because in a heist, you know, you need a crew. He has got a con man who is his sister. Um, he has a thief. Uh, he has a getaway driver, a hacker. Um, and each member of the crew kind of has their own their own kind of like place in the in the heist, um, but also their own complicated relationship with their identity as uh, Chinese Americans. But when we'll ask them, none of us can turn down the chance of a century. Um, I am looking forward so much to this book, which I'm sure is going to be very multi-layered. I love the idea in one of the reviews, they were quite angry that these people were planning their heist over WhatsApp and that they made their entire plan on a Google doc. But I'm like, 
genius genius how else are you going to plan a heist in today's now and age you got to do the google docs um so i am super excited for uh grace d lee's uh first book which has got a great cover which is portrait of a thief i'm choosing virginia for my heist team so she can do all the spreadsheets yeah that i can do for you <laughs> if you need a spreadsheet i can do that <laughs> Um, and that's that's also kind of a Sadie tribute too, because Sadie also loves a good heist. Who doesn't love a heist though? Who doesn't love that's a true. heist? But she especially loves a good heist. That's true. So that's I true. feel like, yeah, they, you know, you have to include her on your heist team. For sure. I think we had an episode on heist and we talked about like what role we would be. Yes, we'll have to go back because I can't remember. I don't remember either. <laughs> I mean, obviously, I would love to steal something, but I can't remember what I do in it. Yeah, I don't feel like you were on the episode. Fiona, what would you be if you were a? I you wanted to be the driver. You want to be yeah, like it, like in Mini Driver. No, that is not. That's a person's name. What was the driver film? Are you talking about Baby Driver? Baby yeah. Driver. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what is a baby but a mini adult? Right. Yeah. No, that's. <laughs> Oh, that's great. All right, Fiona, what is your last book? All right. This is my num my oh, this is my four of four <laughs> book. And I think, you know, I say I'm looking forward to all of them, but I think I'm looking forward to this one the most. Uh, my last pick is uh KK by Vishnavi Patel. It is a retelling of the story of Kekie, who is a princess in the Ramayana. So that is a Hindi epic. Um, I remember reading pieces of it in undergrad, but it will definitely be a good like like a good fodder for a new project. Uh, of I love to read a historical fiction and then sort of like go look at source material and learn what they changed. And, um, but the, the reviews for this one have been amazing of just like, wow, what an amazing ter interpretation. Um, you know, it's additive rather than just being like, wow, that was a strange choice. Um, and so they're comparing it to Circe, which is a book that I absolutely loved by Madeline Miller. Um, I think in part because I think KKA is a, um, is a kind of an evil princess. Uh, she um, is like, I think seen as like a jealous, um, yeah, woman and sort of been vilified. Um, so this promises to be kind of like Circe in a reimagining of um, uh, women's roles uh, and, and how they are vilified. So, uh, it also uh, has a queer twist. I believe they have uh, imagined her as being asexual, which is uh, pretty awesome. Uh, something that I'm excited to see how that plays out. Um, and so uh, I believe that Kekie is born into a royal family um, and she is sort of, um, I guess diminished to uh, you know who she can be married to, and uh, just um, her whole worth is you know based on the marriage uh, allegiance that she can make, um, and she does become uh, one of three wives. Um, and again, I think it's I think the the um, narrative is sort of that she's like conniving um but this one is imagining her as a warrior and a diplomat um and i've already used it once so i might as well say it again it sounds super badass <laughs> maybe maybe i'm giving virginia a lot of editing to do um but yeah i just i can't believe how many books i'm finding uh, coming out that are just going to indulge my like excitement about like drawing on historical fiction, but then sort of, um, yeah, giving you more to imagine. And I'm just, I feel like it's what I need this year just to like 
dive into something that is going to have all of these other things that I can uh, then then read about. So very much looking forward to uh, this reimagining of Keiki's uh, story from the Ramayana by Vishnavi Patel. And that is coming out in April. So I will have to read the other books first, I guess. Oh no, I have an advanced copy. Oh, I'm so excited. I just remembered. <laughs> Yeah, I've actually, I have a, for the first time, Fiona, I actually have a, kept that on my list too. Yeah, I've got an advance for that too. So, because that sounds super interesting. I know it's weird. I don't know. It's more a, it's more a Fiona book than Virginia book, but I've got it on my list. So we shall see how that goes. Corinne, why are you shaking your head? <laughs> Like this is a year of surprises. It is not often that that Venn diagram of Fiona and Virginia come together. Not often, but it does happen. It does, it does happen. happen. Yeah. Does happen. Yeah. I've actually read a couple Fiona book um, before after Fiona. And I got Cersei somewhere in my house. I bought it at a book sale. And so it's there. Like, so I just have to get into it at some point. But yeah, sometimes, sometimes. Every once in a while. Just like yeah. I, if again, your diagram can I, my diagram can like, get together every now and then then you know it happens one book a year virginia one yeah what would that be year. maybe that should be what i'm looking forward to this year is that one book whatever that is yeah well it's not going to be the one that i'm talking about next um yeah i didn't think so okay what are you no. talking about? <laughs> No, so 2022 for me is going to be all crime all the time. I just realized that every single book that I am talking about is a mystery or is crime adjacent, um, but that's okay. I'm playing to my brand um, and I am so excited about this, my number one pick of the year, um, which is by the same author of my 2020 top book of the year. Um, I am so excited. As soon as I saw that it was announced last year, I was I was full of anticipation. And so I cannot wait to get my hands on this one. And this is the newest book by Simone St. James, The Book of Cold Cases. This is me this is me this is just me this is I know Virginia knew that I was going to pick this book you knew in your heart Virginia and you were correct um because this 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 is my Venn diagram in 1997 the small sleepy village of Clear Lake Oregon was rocked by the lady killer murders two men seemingly picked at random were murdered with the same gun and strange cryptic notes were left behind at each scene. One woman was found fleeing the scene of one of the murders, Beth Greer. She was the perfect suspect. Rich, a little bit strange, 23 years old, and generally disliked by the entire community. However, that was not enough to put her behind bars. Although she was put on trial, she was eventually acquitted and has spent the last 40 years in isolation, locked up in her mansion, seeing no one, talking to no one, and never mentioning the crimes again. We fast forward to 2017, where Shay Collins is a receptionist at a doctor's office. By day, she works a pretty menial job trying to forget her past trauma, but by night, she runs a true crime website called The Book of Cold Cases. And this is an attempt to kind of deal with what happened in her past, which has led her to be obsessed with true crime. When by chance, Beth Greer walks into the doctor's office, she cannot stop herself. Without thinking about it, she asks Beth to do an interview for her blog. And to Shay's surprise, Beth agrees. But she has one condition, that Shay come up to her mansion and do the interviews there. And the more time that Shay spends in Beth's charming, delightful company, in the strange, oppressive home that she lives in, she begins to feel that something is wrong. Maybe with Beth or maybe with the house itself. 
she starts to hear strange footsteps running upstairs when she's talking to her. She sees sink faucets turn on in front of her. And she maybe sees the image of a young girl in a doorway. When everyone knows that Beth Greer has lived alone for the past 40 years. And so Shay has to ask herself, is she making friends with a manipulative murderer? Or is she befriending an outcast, someone misunderstood by the entire town, wrongly accused of a terrible murder? Or are there other dangers lurking inside the darkness of the Greer Mansion? So that is The Book of Cold Cases by Simone St. James. It sounds like handwritten for you. Ah, I'm so glad. I'm so glad one of your favorite authors is coming up with a book in 2022. So you have something to do other than listening to your BTS and watching BTS video. I can do both at the same time. I can multitask. Like you can put a BTS on album on and then like listen to a creepy or like read a creepy book. Like you could do both. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you have all your favorites all lined up, ready to go. My favorites are really delivering this year and I thank them for it. Yes. Yes. We need that. We all need that. Well, thank you to both of you for sharing your most anticipated books for the next few months. Um, so yeah, so tune in next week. Uh, Liz and I will talk about the books that we are looking forward to reading. I feel like they will be quite different, but I'm pretty sure there will still be murder involved because Liz is also in interested in that i am pretty sure so yeah um so tune in for that and then uh, we'll see you again next week bye, bye. bye.